Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Ben Kishore, Professor of Environmental Governance and Political Science at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. His research interests focus on non-state market-driven environmental governance and impact and opportunities of globalization and internationalization on domestic and local environmental policy, corporate sustainability initiatives, and comparative environmental policy. He is a prolific author of books and articles that integrate public policy, corporate social responsibility, and international environmental governance. Today, we will talk with him about global forest governance. Welcome, Professor Kishore. Thank you. So, you um, have recently written a paper, which we'll get to in a minute, but let's talk about some of the key challenges to global um, forest governance today. Sure, there are essentially two major challenges. Mm -hmm. One concerns the degradation of global fo the world's forests. Okay. Uh, for example, forest ecosystems um, are being negatively impacted by a range of practices from industrial logging to illegal logging activities that make the forest worse, worse off than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And so how do we think about policies aimed at improving forest management are very important. Um, mm -hmm. But secondly, we also face deforestation challenges where other sectors from industrial palm oil plantations to mining and so on act in ways to reduce the forest landscape mm -hmm. which causes many negative externalities and influences um, forest livelihoods and forest ecosystems in really permanent and negative ways. Mm -hmm. What are some of the countries where this problem is the worst? Yeah, it's a very good question because there, every country faces important forest challenges mm -hmm. um, including North America in Europe. We even had, for example, big debates over the northern spotted owl and its reliance on old growth forests in the U.S. Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. that came with all kinds of debates about what kinds of things we ought to do to preserve both jobs but also the environment. Sure. Um, but increasingly so, a lot of attention is placed on tropical forests where they're the subject of much scrutiny mm -hmm. owing to uh, the role of um, uh, agricultural crops like palm oil causing um, deforestation and also the important role of forest dependent communities who are increasingly facing uh, lifelong poverty cycles mm -hmm. and we try to think about how forests might help improve them in getting out of their uh, current um, right. situation. I imagine it also affects the animal populations too um, and forces the animals to go other places when the forests are cut down. That's right. So forest ecosystems are home to incredible biodiversity, mm -hmm. especially in the tropics. So right. from orangutans to um, microbial species, we are, we are having, the scientists tell us, negative and enduring impacts on biodiversity loss in these regions. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so um, in getting to your paper, um, you look at in your paper whether or not legality verification um, can rescue global forest governance. Yes. So if you can um, tell us what you mean by that term and also um, what it means uh, for global forest governance. Who governs? Yeah, it's a really good question because for the most part, nation states are the places in which policies are developed to address ongoing forest challenges. Mm -hmm. And this notion that governments have sovereign authority to develop um, rules governing problems in their own territories is an enduring principle of international relations. Mm -hmm. However, it's increasingly recognized that we need some kind of international cooperation around forests, owing in part to biodiversity losses that are global in nature, but also because international trade in forest products is both causing many problems that we are witnessing from deforestation to degradation, mm -hmm. but also might give us the opportunity to actually reverse those pressures and perhaps f help us find innovative solutions to these challenges. Okay. And so when I say and ask the question, can markets rescue global forest governance? What I'm pondering is, you know, we've had 25, 30 years of efforts internationally on the part of the world's governments mm -hmm to address deforestation and degradation, and even more recently, the climate impacts of deforestation. Mm -hmm. However, all these initiatives, while well-intended, have not had their desired effects. There's been a lack of concerted international cooperation that can meaningfully 
uh, address these challenges in, a, in an enduring, important way. So the question is, can we develop the proper economic incentives that might actually encourage forest companies and those conducting deforestation to change their practices, mm -hmm. to, be, to be rewarded economically for being stewards of the environment and for reducing deforestation, reducing climate emissions? And we think the answer is a possible yes, mm -hmm. depending on how um, practitioners and government officials come together to nurture these kinds of processes. And do you have um, some kind of guidelines in order to do that? Yeah, so we say any effort to do this has to recognize a really difficult dilemma. And that is the more you use um, market incentives, and by this I mean either eco-labeling incentives mm -hmm. in which the very top producers are rewarded with a, a label for practicing excellent forest practices and who are audited for compliance to standards by third-party um, independent verifiers. Or it might mean focusing on what we, talk, we, we refer to as legality verification, mm -hmm. where producers are simply recognized for um, addressing and identifying legal requirements, even if they're not considered um, gold standard requirements. Mm -hmm. In both those cases, the conundrum is that the costs of compliance cannot be so high that they countervail or trump the economic incentives. Mm -hmm. And that means that the more you can increase economic incentives, either through customer awareness, for example, consumers paying more for green products, or through government procurement policies requiring that anything they buy comes from sustainable sources, mm -hmm. or other means, for example, through trade agreements, Anything we can do to increase the economic incentives and requirements will actually therefore help on the ground practices. This creates a chicken and egg conundrum as you build supply and build demand towards these um, sustainable um, products. Mm -hmm. um, it is therefore an incremental process, a back and forth process, which means that initially the impacts on the ground will not be as significant as they will, will be at a later time when the market is fully entrenched and we're all buying these certified and legal materials. So how we get there is very important. And we think the more that um, practitioners and stakeholders and environmental groups focus on the mechanisms for doing so, for example, supply chain tracking, the better we, off we are in actually addressing on the ground forest practices. Mm -hmm. Currently, we're focusing attention on what are the best practices that ought to be implemented on the ground, which is an excellent effort but by itself is not enough. We've had 30 years of efforts identifying the best practices, and now we need more efforts on the mechanisms for compliance. This means, for example, thinking about technologies like DNA uh, technology, um, GIS, satellite imagery, and even cell phone technology to better improve the tracking of forest products from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from Africa to North American and European consumers who often will um, pay more for these kinds of sustainable products. Who would be responsible, though, for, for that tracking? I mean, who ultimately monitors all of this? And there's, two, two, there's a two-part answer to mm -hmm. your question. So the first is to think carefully about the coalitions mm -hmm. of support. And what we're finding is that coalitions of what political science refers to as bootleggers and Baptists mm -hmm. are emerging to support legality verification. And what this means is that very different interests, in this case, uh, legal timber producers and environmental activists mm -hmm. are on the same side on this question because both have a strategic self-interest in supporting legality verification. The legal producers in the timber industry do because they actually gain an economic benefit. By weeding out supply, you end up increasing the price, and that's good for their bottom line. Mm -hmm. Environmental activists see a need to be support this to actually weed out some of the worst practices in the world, illegally harvested timber. Mm -hmm. As a result, you have very strange bedfellows of bootleggers and Baptists, meaning two very different kinds of groups, um, supporting these enduring, these policies aimed at reducing illegal logging. So once we get in place the notions of why the coalitions are emerging, and we realize it means tending simultaneously to environmental and economic interests, mm -hmm. then we can think about the second question, which is how do we do it? And that means um, developing uh, a system 
in which companies have an incentive in, in being part of the tracking process. Mm -hmm. So as long as the costs of compliance, um, that is building tracking systems of legally harvested timber, are smaller than the economic rents they achieve by reducing uh, the bad supply, companies will be in favor of helping promote these collaborative efforts. Mm -hmm. And this means that only by having companies, governments, stakeholders across the world united by these forest product supply chains, together collaborating on tracking, can we actually achieve some kind of enduring success on the me mechanism side of this mm -hmm. question. So help me understand if someone is doing illegal logging, how that plays into what you've just laid out. Okay, thank you. Very good question because what we're finding is that illegal activity, which can occur in a, in a number of circumstances, but it's essentially capturing those processes where um, companies and individuals go into forests and harvest um, the logs uh, without any permission mm -hmm. of doing so, without any kinds of constraints and controls about environmental stewardship, without paying attention to annual harvest rates and so on, can lead to enduring and lasting effects of uh, degradation mm -hmm. to the environment um, because there's no uh, legally enforced uh, environmental stewardship taking place. So by weeding out this lumber from markets and requiring that um, companies and individuals follow local law laws about reforestation, about how to harvest in an eco-sensitive way, we can start to begin to make a difference on the ground governing these global environmental challenges mm -hmm. in the forest sector. Right? So it can actually lead to a win-win opportunity where those who do produce in a legal way may actually help address these ongoing challenges of deforestation and degradation versus mm -hmm. being part of the, the problem. Right, right. So uh, again though, yeah. if someone has a shipment of illegally harvested yeah. wood, yes. what actually happens? No one will buy it because they know it's illegal? Okay, right. How, what exactly happens in that instance? So what's happened recently, mm -hmm. uh, and why this is a very important topic for students of international regulation policy and international trade, is that both the United States and the European Union have passed international trade legislation within their own territories mm -hmm. requiring that any importer of wood show due care that it did not come from illegal sources. Mm -hmm. So although it's a market mechanism, the compliance incentives come from US and EU domestic legislation. Mm -hmm. And this has created a much more different incentive than eco-labeling programs, which relied on goodwill on the part of consumers and retailers to support these things. It turns out that fear of going to jail for breaking the law is a much greater motivator than simple goodwill mm -hmm. was in the, in the past. Right. right? Um, it's one thing, though, to have the UK and the US have this right. uh, agreement. And looking at the maps, it looks like South America, China, parts of Russia are really the yeah. ones who are doing most of the illegal stuff. Yeah. So are they trading with each other and are there no right. ramifications there? Right. In a 10 year period from the mid 1990s to the mid 2000s, um, the, uh, China increased dramatically its imports from these key countries we're talking about, mm -hmm. Indonesia, Malaysia, Gabon and so on. They used that material to manufacture products, many of which went to the US and EU markets. Mm -hmm. So in that same time frame, Chinese exports of manufactured forest products to the United States went up 1,000% and to the Europe, 800%. Why? Because these are incredibly lucrative markets. Mm -hmm. So the same markets creating pressure on China and creating demand on Indonesia for these products might also be the places to find some kind of solution mm -hmm. to these challenges. This is not simply about Indonesia or Malaysia or Gabon making mistakes. This is about North American and European consumption mm -hmm. creating and, and being the ultimate causes of this destruction we're witnessing. Okay. Um, so standing back, what forestry challenges do you think are best left to public policies and which are more appropriate for market interventions? That's a great question. I would argue in the last 20 years, we've placed far too great attention on market mechanisms as providing 
all the answers mm -hmm. to our problems. That's not possible. Right. Some things markets can do very well. And we would argue, for example, that when it comes to regulating commercial forest practices in the forest sector, so how to improve your harvesting, your streams, mm -hmm. how to reforest, how to maintain a sustainable level of cut. These are things that markets could do very well by saying to producers, if you want access to our markets or to Home Depot, you have to abide by a certain standards, mm -hmm. okay? That makes sense. And we can think about how then a global community united around these supply chains could help enforce those kinds of laws mm -hmm. and standards. However, when it comes to biodiversity loss, deforestation, that's often owing to other sectors, for example, industrial palm oil plantations, um, then it seems that market mechanisms don't have that much teeth. Okay? While we've spent 20 years nurturing market mechanisms, we've had ongoing deforestation in Indonesia, mm -hmm. which um, scientists have told us now equal the same in carbon emissions alone to U.S. auto emissions wow. per year. Okay? This means that we need much tougher, I would argue, government policies when it comes to land use designation. Mm -hmm. What land is going to be for the working forest? What land will be set aside for um, biodiversity conservation? My worry is that by giving all attention to market mechanisms, we made two fundamental errors. One, by giving markets too much attention, too much responsibility, they were burdened under the weight of too many responsibilities, and therefore they couldn't achieve more modest objectives uh, that could have been in place. Second, by giving them everything to do, we took the problem definition off of government agendas, who, who said simply, hey, markets are addressing this question, mm -hmm. when that was a cop-out. Right. The question is, how do we better integrate, find synergies among government policies on the one hand and markets on the other hand? This requires a much more concerted effort around the problems mm -hmm. that we all care about. And do you think it's possible to um, meld the two? I actually do. I think it's not easy. Mm -hmm. People call me um, an optimist. I think I'm just much more of a concerned, problem-focused political scientist. And I see possibilities for doing so. Mm -hmm. It requires that the great coalition we now have globally um, that's emerging to address legality verification mm -hmm. because the strategic self-interest of so many organizations unite around this, this uh, instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires that the same coalition think carefully about then what they can do collectively to solve some problems that need other instruments and other tools. And how can we therefore work in a synergistic uh, way, linking theories of why support occurs to strategies for better improving on the ground performance um, around these kinds of institutions? Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> okay, Do you, are there any other efforts that you think can be undertaken to improve global forest governance? Yeah, so there, there are a number. What I would argue is most important, and which is actually happening right now, or will be happening very soon, rather, um, at the uh, uh, UNFCCC meeting in Poland in November, is that there's now what's called a landscape day. And this is an effort to unite the world's governments mm -hmm. and think tanks and strategists around these very questions about cross-sectoral interactions. And this idea is that by more carefully learning about the science of biodiversity conservation mm -hmm. and loss and about the instruments available, that we can, through what is called policy learning among stakeholders and governments, achieve more enduring success. Mm -hmm. And this requires attention to a policy learning architecture that is designed not just to achieve agreement on standards, but to generate knowledge about causal mechanisms that might actually help address problems. Mm -hmm. So I would say policy learning architecture is now emerging as a key way to think about addressing these problems and it's fundamental for um, developing mm -hmm. and for building um, these kinds of approaches that might have a chance of reversing uh, deforestation mm -hmm. and forest degradation problems that all of us around the world um, do and must care about. Right, right. Yeah. That is the key, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. My pleasure. Thank you.
For more information about Professor Kishore and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.